Hey there, welcome to Dirt Rich, seasonal conversations on food and farming. I'm Katie Federal of the Sustainable Farming Association, and I'm excited to have Megan Benage join the podcast as our guest today. Megan is a regional ecologist for the Minnesota DNR, one of the podcast hosts of the Prairie Pod, and in her free time, she also moonlights as a columnist for our Connect e-newsletter, authoring the often poetic Beyond Your Backyard. We'll be discussing Megan's role in the field of ecology and how that intersects with the agricultural world. Let's get right to it. Thanks, Katie. Thanks for joining today, Megan. Yeah. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> it's so fun to have another like podcast person on the podcast. And uh, yeah, someone so intertwined with uh, ecology and SFA's work and agriculture. And I think we'll just start right out with like, could you tell us what the day in the life of a regional ecologist looks like? What do you do? Yeah, I get asked this question all the time, and it is the hardest question for me to answer because every day (laughs) is different. It's fun. Most days are really fun, but every day is very different. So I cover 32 counties in Southern Minnesota. I'm the only ecologist for this region. And so as an ecologist, I was once told by a fourth grader that I study the economy, which, (laughs) you know, now that I think about it more and more, he might be onto something. Because when we're talking about the environment and we're talking about our ecological health, that has direct impacts to our economy. And certainly in a state like Minnesota, where we're a prairie state, we're an agricultural state, and we're absolutely an outdoor recreation state. So all those things are intertwined with our economy. So most of what I actually do, though, is I'm looking at all the parts and pieces of the landscape. So the soil, the water, the animals, the plants, the industry, the people. And I'm trying to make sure all those pieces are working well together so that we have a healthy Minnesota. And so a normal day could be something like a landowner calling and wanting to know, what's this plant? What's this animal? What's this thing that I got right here? That that could be part of my day. It's usually part of most days um, to designing a a large-scale prairie restoration in partnership with either U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or one of our wildlife managers or the Nature Conservancy and trying to figure out how are we going to build this amazing prairie landscape back? How are we going to get in better balance? So then I could be doing something like this where I'm podcasting on the Prairie Pod, trying to connect people to this amazing prairie landscape and make sure they understand more about it. Or I could be winding everything out with permitting. So looking at solar, wind, mining projects, and trying to make sure that we minimize impacts or avoid impacts to rare and endangered species and habitats. There's a lot. Yeah. (laughs) It's a lot of different things all together. I mean, ecology is like, we're the people in school who are like, yeah, so I like, uh, I like plants. Okay, so I like animals too. Oh boy. Okay, so I like all of these things. And we just couldn't decide between the things. So we chose ecology so that we could study all of them together. Oh my gosh. Yeah, never a dull moment, I'm sure. <laughs> there is never a dull moment. And so most of the summer, I'm in the field actually collecting data on our amazing natural resources. So trying to get better at understanding our ecological systems like calcareous fens and prairies. And so we have to, the only way we're going to learn is if we actually observe. And so that's a lot of what I do in the summer. A lot of hiking, Mm. a lot of snacks are necessary to get through my summer. Right. Yeah. Just before we started recording, you were mentioning um, that it's been a very busy time. What's, what are your focuses right now? What are you keeping busy with? Yeah, it is a very busy time. So during the summer, like I said, I'm out collecting data on our calcareous fen communities. So in Minnesota, those are protected under state statute. And so I am basically looking at them and trying to evaluate their health and their current status. So do they have impacts? Do they have the right groundwater flow? Do they have the right plants in them that we would expect to see? And then I'm also looking at a lot of our prairie restorations and evaluating them to see, hey, did what we plant grow? And we hope the answer to that is yes. <laughs> and then did we get it right with our planning? And obviously you can put the best plan together and then nature throws curveball at you. And so we just have to be ready to adapt just like the prairie does every single day. So right now, one of the most interesting things we're seeing, and I know you're going to ask me about this more later, but with the drought, our calcareous fens are pretty much one of the only things that's green on the landscape because they're described as this Goldilocks habitat. So they need just the right conditions to persist. 
but they rely on a constant supply of upwelling groundwater. And so they basically are a stable fixed point in the landscape as long as we're not doing anything. People, that's the we, as long as we're not doing anything that would draw the water away from them. So it's pretty neat because the plants in them have been happy just living in their little Edens, loving their life. So that's been nice. Nice to see for sure. Oh, absolutely. And for, I mean, I hadn't heard of a is it calcareous? Fan? I know we chose the hardest word possible <laughs> so that people <laughs> then have to do that when they're like, what's that cool, neat wetland habitat you were talking about? The c- c- calcareous pen. Yes. Yeah. So it's calcareous because it's calcium rich. Okay. And so if you just say we have different kinds of fens in Minnesota, and so not all of them are calcareous fens. And so that's the distinction that we're making, that these have a high level of calcium, which makes them actually a really difficult environment for a plant to live in. And so some of our plants, they're literally sweating calcium because they have so much of it. The pH is so high. This is not going to come as a surprise to the farmers who are listening, but most plants like a pH somewhere around five and a half, six and a half. It may be six and a half to six, eight being like the optimum range. And so when we start getting things above seven, which is what we're dealing with in a calcareous fen, that is a tough environment to be in because you have a tremendous amount of calcium that you have to deal with. So you have this one adorable plant called the low nut rush that actually uses that calcium to form the shell of its seed. So nothing goes to oh, waste. Oh, is that the one with the little like snowball yes, like thing? Okay, it like a that tiny was in one of your snowball. columns. That I was know. very adorable. <laughs> it's a very adorable plant. But then you think about it, you're like, oh man, it's living a tough life. I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> a happy life, but it's it's adapting and using what it has to survive and thrive. So, I mean, clearly you are extremely passionate about ecology and Minnesota wildlife and ecology. What originally drew you to this field? What, what sparked your interest? I mean, I think I'm going to have to say my mom, right? Like, mm. like I, think that's, yeah. I think that's what the answer that we're going to have to give. So my mom is probably one of the most amazing people on the planet. Although I'm not sure she knows that mom, you should listen so that you know that. So she is absolutely wonderful. And when we were kids, you know, we, we were, I don't know. We didn't have a ton of money. So we went to national parks. That's what we did. I probably have a junior ranger badge from every national park. Not yeah, every single one. Yeah. Those were but so fun. Yeah. I know. I'm getting there. I'm getting close. I've got an impressive stack of ra- junior ranger badges <laughs> in my closet. But so we, um, you know, that, that is what we did because it was affordable and we camped. And so she just has a deep love for the natural world and she's one of seven kids. And so that's what they did growing up also. So sort of passing along that legacy of Mm. sharing the joy of ecology and conservation. And so that's, that's what started it all. But I, I really have to credit my college. So I went to Purdue university and I, had the opportunity there to participate in a prairie restoration project in my undergrad. And I remember I was mixing the seed mixes together. So we want to get even distribution when we're planting. And so one of the things we were doing, and and some farmers probably do this with their cover crop mixes too. We were in a big shed and we were mixing all the seeds together. And I didn't even know I was doing it, but I guess I was stopping and smelling handfuls of seeds. (laughs) They all smell different. They smell good. Like if you've ever taken a, uh, I'm trying to think of a common name. I'm like a rotibuto panada. That sounds so ostentatious. If you've ever taken a gray headed cone flower, one of those yellow cone flowers and crushed the seed head, it just has this spicy smell to it. And so different oh. prairie seeds have different scents. And then of course, grass seed just smells nice. Right. So we, so we're, we're mixing it all together. I'm smelling it. And my Major professor was like, hey, you're a prairie restoration ecologist. And I was like, what now? And he was like, (laughs) only prairie restoration ecologists stop and smell the seed like that. And I was like, oh, well, maybe I am. You, you, you don't know my life. So, but, (laughs) but he was very right because I just fell in love with the mystery and the wonder of the prairie and there's nothing else like it. It's absolutely incredible. And to be in a state like Minnesota where we are absolutely blessed to have so 
much more of the prairie left than a lot of states do. Uh, and that's coming in at just under 2%, which still is not a lot. But to have 235,000 acres of remnant reference prairie to go to and explore and understand that puzzle better is really a gift. And so I'm just committed now. We're, we're soulmates. We're in a long-term serious relationship, me and the prairie. And we've got to figure out how we're going to save it so that we don't lose this part of our legacy because it's part of who we are as a state. A third of the state used to be covered in tall grass prairie. And so that's a huge legacy that we have. I know like if you talk to any fourth grader, right, they would tell you and you said, hey, where do you get oxygen from? What are they all going to yell? Trees! <laughs> you know, but we live in southern Minnesota and trees are great, but we are in the prairie part of the world and we get our oxygen from those prairie and wetland plants. And so we need to be yelling prairie <laughs> like just <laughs> as loud as we're yelling trees. <laughs> so uh, with the your comments on the junior ranger and then the, I like I'm remembering these maps that we've often seen of the kind of like Minnesota break broke down into thirds of like, this is like coniferous forward and the hardwoods, and this is the prairie section. And maybe, so it sounds like the prairie section may be a little bit more generous than it actually is. Is it more patchy rather than a, it's pretty patchy. Yeah. yeah. So it runs all the way up a uh, Northwest corridor of Minnesota down to Southwestern Minnesota, and then over to Southeast Minnesota with a chunk in the center also. And so then we have some sporadic prairie pieces and patches around the cities and north of the cities. But once you start getting into, you know, solid northeast Minnesota, you're, you're in mostly woodland habitat there. That's forest. Mm -hmm. And so but it, it's very patchy. And what we're trying to do is connect it so that it can persist. That's diversity, connection and community are if I could have taglines that I put on a button <laughs> or those would be the three taglines that guide my work, diversity, connection, community. It's how we're going to get everything done. And it's, it's true from, if you, I'm looking at it as an ecologist, that's true. But also if I'm just looking at it from a social dynamic as a person, it's true. We're only mm -hmm. going to accomplish what we need to accomplish with diversity, connection, and community. I like that a lot. This part of the state that you're talking about that has a lot of prairie and you're trying to connect also is a, like, I want to pull this into agriculture now. Um, there's a lot of farmland there. And, and so, Absolutely. I mean, looking at that, and I'm curious generally, like, how has your work as an ecologist intersected with, like, the agricultural world? Oh, it's incredibly intertwined. I mean, there are so many opportunities there to partner together, to work together, to figure this out. Mm -hmm. um, we... As a state, you know, we have roughly 55.6 million acres. These are the stats that people can repeat at dinner time just to be like, look at how cool I am. I know how many acres we have. And 27 million of those are in agriculture. So we are absolutely only going to achieve what we're trying to achieve by working together. And the agriculture mm -hmm. community has a huge potential to affect the prairie landscape in a big way. And so things that you do on farm can add and complement to this prairie landscape that we're trying to connect back to. And so we're not trying to, I want to make sure this is clear. We're not trying to go back to where prairie is a third of the state. That's not going to happen. Like that's not what the goal is, but we want to take those 235,000 acres that are sometimes in these tiny separated patches and we want to connect them together so that we get big enough chunks of connected land so that the prairie can be resilient and do what it's supposed to do because we benefit from that. If we have healthy connected habitat, that directly impacts our quality of life. And so, and that could even, there's agribusiness opportunities there also, whether we're talking about mm -hmm. honeybees or we're talking about grazing grasslands and then agribusiness aside, I like to breathe clean air. I tend to enjoy that. It's something that seems like it's important to me in my life. I also like to drink clean water and I like to have flood control and I like to have drought resilience and prairies do that. They do all of those things for us. And so sometimes we just see them as like a patch of land and we wonder what it's going to become, but it's already doing yeah. this wonderful, magical thing for us. And we just have to learn more about it so that we can understand those connections. I always like to tell people, 
you know, because most people drink coffee. I shouldn't say most people. Some people do. They like coffee and chocolate. And we just sort of forget that everything is connected in this world. And so you can thank a bee for your morning cup of coffee and you can thank a fly for your afternoon chocolate break. And so these are these are all things that rely on other habitats to exist. And so it's weird to think about as you're sitting there having your your morning pick me up that you're like, I should be thanking a bee right now. But you, <laughs> but you should because it's all connected. Uh. Yeah, as a as an aspiring beekeeper, I th- that's an easy connection for me to like think of like oh yeah I would enjoy my first you know cup of tea in the morning even just like thinking about honeybees too and right, <laughs> appreciating exactly. them. But yeah, yeah, it is it, it does get so separated sometimes. I think even uh, looking at like prairie land, you would see it, it would be easy to see that as very separate from farmland or to wonder why like oh should we. Well, and that's how we're taught too. I had a great conversation with Kent Solberg about this the other day. Mm. I hate giving him compliments, but I'll give him some. So, (laughs) you know, we had a great conversation about it, how typically, traditionally, um, we're taught as conservationists to sort of put agriculture separately. And I think agriculturally, and I'm not talking about regenerative agriculture, but like conventional agriculture, I think we're taught not to think about those conservation aspects and the two go together. They have to go together. So every regenerative agriculture model that we have is based on how a prairie is just living its life and highly functioning and doing all the things that it's supposed to do. I mean, if you look at the work that Gabe Brown has done at his farm, he will even say, I'm going to paraphrase him, but he will even say that he is looking to the prairie to figure out how it's doing what it's doing. And it comes back to diversity, connection, and community. And so Mm -hmm. if we can instill in our farm some of what the prairie is teaching us, trying desperately to teach us every single day, we're not only going to be more profitable, but we're going to be a healthier population. And I'm going to go so far as to say we're going to be happier. Because when you have your, you're taking care of your land and you're taking care of yourself, it's just, it just all comes together. Right. Yeah. It seems like some application for that little hierarchy of needs. Like these things are all coming together when the, you know, the function at a most basic level is working out. Absolutely. It's just the balance is the tricky part, figuring out how we're going to get everything in balance. And we make no mistake, we are not in balance now. And that is, I think, I like to be really positive about all of these things that I'm talking about, but we also have to be honest. And so we are to have 2% of a landscape left and to expect it to function like it has, you know, a hundred percent is not going to work. It can't. And so we're going to have to find a way that we can complement what we have left so that it can work so that it can be resilient because we are facing a lot of really scary things, particularly climate change. And I'm sure everybody who's listening knows, gosh, we, we just came out of a bunch of wet years and now we're, we're in a drought. It's feast or famine. And even when it's feast, it's unpredictable feast, right? Six inch rain is not a fun thing to deal with. And so we've got to learn from the prairie. There's very little runoff coming off of a prairie with a six inch rain. So what is it doing? How is it maximizing that resource and capturing that water so that it stays on the prairie? And if we can mimic that and do that on farm, we're just going to be better, better at life Mm -hmm. in general. Oh, I appreciate this so much because we, SFA goes a lot off of like the five principles of soil health, which seem to also just be like, principles of the prairie too right like we have like have a diversity in the soil having a living root in the soil integrating livestock or like animal wildlife um and i really appreciate what you were saying about like we're, we're looking to the prairie or we're looking to this ecosystem function um because it seems like a lot of answers or solutions or resilience builders um that we are kind of can be in desperate need of or looking for right now um is accessible and in front of us if we pay attention it's also you know indigenous knowledge too that has been like it's it's been there all this whole time it's right there the land has much to tell us if we just sit for a while and listen to what it has to say and so what are some like practical examples i suppose of um, what that could look like on a farm so you're talking about water infiltration or retention like what lessons from the prairie could you implement on a farm to do that 
Yeah. So it's how do you incorporate diversity on farm, right? And so mm-hmm. one of the one of the number one things I'm going to recommend, it's not going to be surprising, is that try <laughs> to carve out some habitat acres onto your farm. Because, mm-hmm. and if you want to know, well, okay, so this is just going to be my set aside area. That's often how it's described to me by farmers yeah. or, or folks. And I'm like, no, it's not your set aside area. This is your predator production area. And so you want to grow a good prairie on your farm so that you get good predators that are going to eat things like soybean aphid for you. You want to create a nice little habitat so that your lady beetles are flying all around and they're hungry and they're ready (laughs) to go after the pests that you traditionally have on farm. And so that is you know, providing that habitat isn't just critical for, you know, something really nice to look at. It's not just set aside. It is working. It is producing something that is going to be usable for your production and for your bottom line. And that's something that I think we don't necessarily always think about. And then in particular, if you happen to have any fruit crops or anything else or vegetable crops, if that is also your area that is providing pollinators so that you're getting production values that way also. If you're growing corn and soybeans, it's really more of a predator production area. You can get a tiny bump from pollinators on soybeans, but wind is, is wind. Corn is wind <laughs> pollinated. Wind is corn pollinated. <laughs> corn is wind pollinated. So you know, that's, that's not happening there, but Mm -hmm. things that you can do in those more traditional crops is you want to try to diversify your rotation, no till or zero till is the phrase that I'm going with that I like a lot Mm -hmm. more, reduce your tillage as much as possible. And then cover cropping can be hugely important. And then nutrient pest management. One of the most challenging things is trying to figure out how we can get to a stable state where we're using less pesticides because it's a tool that we have in the toolbox. It does something Mm -hmm. for us and it's part of our production model. But if you hear Gabe Brown and these other folks talk, they are at a point where they're not really using insecticides because they don't need to because they've got natural pest control. And so all of those things, I call it a system. So, and I'm sure you do too. It's a soil health system, just like a prairie is a system, just like our bodies are a system, just like a car is a system for analogy. You want to have all of those parts and pieces in it working together to get you the best outcome. And so I, you know, start with habitat and then you can get get in adventurous, put your soil health system in place. And then you can go even a step further and start doing even more fun stuff like putting prairie strips in between the different rows of your crops. And they've seen in Iowa that with their prairie strips project, they are more profitable on those acres with strips of perennial vegetation in between because of those predator dynamics. And also because that perennial vegetation is trapping and infiltrating water. And it's also trapping sediment from leaving the farm. So soil, your resource, it's keeping it there on farm. And so they're able to be more profitable with some of the land actually taken out of production and put into prairie strips because of what that perennial vegetation can constantly do in conditioning the soil. Ah, you love to hear like the solid resource or research that uh, establishes the economic benefit too, because I think that that'll grab a whole other group of people to make it look more or make them realize that it's doable and it's going to be helpful. It's less scary to make that change. I think if there's a lot of foundation there. Yeah, absolutely doable. And we cannot let Indiana beat us. Come on, Minnesota. (laughs) Let's talk about it. Indiana is reporting numbers of 70% no-till soybeans. We can do that. We can do that. And I know some people listening are like, well, I'm in Northern Minnesota and it's much colder here. We can do it. (laughs) We can do it. It's particularly with soybeans. That is low hanging fruit. And I understand there's changes we have to make to our operation. Change is hard. No matter, Mm -hmm. no matter what change is hard. There's, there's money. I understand there's also access to land issues and everything else, but where there's a will, there's a way. And the weather is not going to be the thing that stops us. It should be the thing that drives us towards it because we are just Mm. going to be in this cycle where it becomes even more unpredictable. So we need to make sure that we are putting the things in place on farm that give us that solid foundation. I had a great conversation with a farmer two weeks ago who basically said to me, 
that he waited. It was very interesting. He was like, I've watched my farmer do no-till for 30 ish years. And I finally decided to do it this year. He's like, I'm getting ready to retire. My son's already taking over some of the acres. And I was like, wow, you waited 30 years to do this. And he was like, yeah. And boy, am I glad that I did because there's no runoff coming off of my farm and my corn looks great this year in the drought. And it was like, we can do a scientific study that shows all of that, right? We can do the study and have the research that shows how, how much sediment, you know, runoff you reduce and how much nitrogen and phosphorus stays on farm and how much water stays on farm. But you don't even need the study because he can see it happening yeah. on his farm. He can see what the changes are, are benefiting. And he was just kind of slow smiling to himself. And he was like, man, did I do it at the right time? And he, I mean, it, it takes some tweaking and manipulating to get it right for your farm. I don't want to make light of that. It certainly does, but it is worth it because you're making a long-term investment in you and the future of Minnesota. And that's got to, that makes you feel good at the end of the day. Yeah. And I think that brings forward such an important piece of um, connecting farmers to each other, because some people will be trying these things and it's through that kind of back and forth and the tweaking and seeing what works in different contexts that can like help make that easier. Like it, it's, I hope people don't necessarily feel like they're going to have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, maybe it looks different in Northern Minnesota than Indiana, but there's gotta be someone who's trying things that you can bounce ideas off of. And um, And there's parallel frameworks that you can use. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then there's also to give you a prairie parallel, so if you think about it, if we're in a conventional system and let's say our, our only two crops are corn and soybeans, right? You can start by adding wheat into that and, and trying to diversify the rotation and figuring out how that's going to work. And you can actually get to a point because I know people are like, oh, wheat, that's not going to give me any profit. You can do it in a way that if it's something like corn, beans, what do I want to say? Corn, corn, beans, wheat, beans, that that five-year system, that five-year cycle can be more profitable than just corn, beans, corn, beans, corn in that five years. So you want to think you're thinking long-term also. And then, okay, here's my real prairie parallel. I just, that's great alliteration (laughs) and we don't want to lose it. So here's my great prairie parallel. (laughs) That if you're doing that with three species, think about what I'm trying to do every single day in my job where I am trying to recreate a landscape that has over 500 species in it. Mm -hmm. And I don't have the genetic makeup and understanding of all of those species. I don't know everything about their life cycles or what they do or what insects they need or what soil connections they need. I am trying to learn all of that and figure that out so that we can build the prairie back. And so it is complex. It is hard and it is a puzzle And it is a puzzle that you, I love what you said when you said people need to talk to each other to figure it out. That is what being a scientist is all about. Have you ever put together an actual puzzle and you're just sitting there holding a piece in your hand forever and you're just like holding it and you're like, I do not know where this thing goes, but I know (laughs) it's part of this puzzle or else I swear somebody ate part of it and it just really doesn't go. And then like somebody walks up behind you and they're like, are you going to put that here? (laughs) And you're just like, what on earth? I had no idea that this beast went right here. And (laughs) that is the power of partnership. And that is what we were doing every single day when we're trying to look at the prairie and connect it. We, Mm. somebody else knows where that piece goes and they've got that inherent knowledge. And if we're just talking to each other, we are going to be so much better together. And I don't just mean scientists. I mean, we need to be talking to landowners. We need to be talking to tribal folks. We need to be talking to all kinds of people so that we are piecing that prairie puzzle together as right as we possibly can. Because we are not at a stage where we are ever going to recreate remnant prairie. Once it's gone, it's gone. Mm -hmm. And all we're doing is creating a very valuable, very important, as close as we can get complement to that. And it's still super important to do, but there's nothing like remnant prairie because of all of these puzzle pieces that we have to figure out. So there's my prairie parallel. (laughs) I appreciate the alliteration too. Uh, I'm going to change gears just a little bit because we've 
brought up like droughts and flooding and other weather extremes. And so I'm curious, like, how has the drought affected, you know, your work this year? What are you seeing in these landscapes? And does that affect then like your conversations or interactions with the agricultural community? Yeah, I'm wondering if there are more prairie parallels here, I guess. Well, sure, there absolutely are. And I mean, you have to remember, we're Midwesterners. We have long been tied together with conversations about the weather. Like this is, <laughs> this is not something, I swear to you, every single conversation with my dad starts with, how's the weather there? Oh, yes. Well, it's <laughs> this, how's the weather there, dad? <laughs> <laughs> that takes about a good 20 minutes of every conversation. And certainly when we're dealing with something as serious as a drought that has long reaching impacts for our, our livelihoods and our families, that's absolutely going to come up and be part of the conversation. And so the good news, at least when it comes to prairies, is that they were inherently designed to be resilient to weather events and they're well equipped to deal with drought. They know how to do it. We've got some prairie plants that have roots that reach down 27 feet. They're limited only by glacial till pretty much. And so we don't even understand. We used to believe that the roots were going that deep so that they could take up water in times of scarcity, but that's not true. We now know that they're taking water in those top couple feet of soil. And it's actually a layered effect where grasses are taking water a little bit higher and then forbs go in a zone slightly lower than that and shrubs a little bit slightly lower than that. But then beyond it, we don't know what they're doing. <laughs> they're just growing deep roots and we don't understand why. That's another one of those great prairie puzzlers. So the prairie is neat because there are some plants that love a drought. Side oats grandma, it has this long seed head and we, you know, botanists are common sense kind of people. So all the little seeds look like oats and they're all on one side of the plant. Side oats grandma. <laughs> so we, we name things in the common sense kind of way. Yeah. It loves a good drought. It really does. It is dominating prairies and it's a short grass species that we don't typically see dominate. And it is just having a great time. We're also seeing some of our sunflowers in huge populations of them that we don't normally see. Purple prairie clover is another one that has orange pollen. And so you'll see these bees in midsummer that look like they're wearing sacks, orange sacks on their legs flying around with their with their purple prairie clover pollen because it's purple prairie clover pollinating top. Say that 20 times fast. And it's, you know, it's incredible, but that change and that adaptability that the prairie shows us is something that can absolutely translate to on farm. And it's hard to do, especially when we have a recipe that is familiar to us and we know it and we love it and we like it. Have you ever done Thanksgiving with the next generation? Like where the kids are all old enough now that they're adults and they want to start cooking some of the food and somebody does something weird with grandma's recipe, like they put cranberries in it. And then, you know, the older generation is like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The cranberries do not go in grandma's stuffing. We did that. No, I don't know what you think you're doing in this kitchen, but we do not put the cranberries in the stuffing. <laughs> this is how it gets made. And then, you know, the kid who's now an adult does it anyway. And then the other person eats it and they're like, well, it's actually pretty good, but I can't tell them that. Like that is basically that thing's giving analogy is what the prairie is doing. And we have to get comfortable with allowing it to change. So we always get fearful when we see, you know, different species emerging or dominating and we want to control it. And we're like, oh my gosh, this whole site is all sunflower this year. We better spray or we better do this. But it's just responding and filling the niche that it is supposed to fill in this type of seasonality. And so I think mm -hmm. that's something that there's a huge lesson there for us because we all have the recipes for how we like to do things, even how our routines for how we farm or how we just get up in the morning and get ready. We have that recipe that works for us, but that adaptability and change, mm -hmm. that is something that we need to get more comfortable with. And we need to be more comfortable with allowing the prairie to do that and just live in its space. It's okay that side oats is going bananas this year and dominating the prairie. It will be different next year. And that's okay. Our job, my job is to make sure there's enough diversity in there 
so that the prairie can adapt and be resilient. And I would say that that message extends to on-farm. We need enough diversity in our farming system, how we are farming, so that it can adapt and be resilient to these weather extremes. Ah, uh, that is such a challenging and I think important idea too of just like, let's, I mean, use the example of adapting for climate change. Like the goal might not necessarily be to like keep everything the same at the levels we've always seen it. Um, but to, there, there's some dynamic in there that is challenging to ride those waves, but that, that is a, a perspective shift that is challenging. And it is but challenging. I, that's important to think about. Wow. Cause yeah. people don't like change. I don't mm-hmm. like change. <laughs> the ways yep. that I like <laughs> to do things. I mean, but that, that is the world we're in right now. We're going to need to be comfortable and be ready and willing to adapt and observe and make sure that the changes that are happening are okay. Right. Mm -hmm. That not just okay from a comfort zone perspective, but okay. Ecologically that we're still, you know, if we're talking about on farm that we're still able to grow a crop, right. We're still able to bring in that revenue that we need to maintain our farm. If we're talking about, um, a prairie system that it's still able to survive and thrive and that it's still able to support the species um, that live there. Right. And I mean, us too, like we're Mm -hmm. part of that system. We're connected to the prairie landscape. We rely and depend on it to support us. It is what is cleaning our water for us. It is what is giving us clean air, particularly in Southern Minnesota. So it's, it's tough. I'm not saying the things I'm saying are easy, They're hard for me too. And I even hear it from our wildlife managers or other folks who are managing our public lands and they're doing an awesome, wonderful job at it. But it is tough for them too when they get used to seeing something in wet years and then we have a dry year and things change. They want to make sure that they're doing right by the resource and that those changes that they're seeing are are okay. And so we have to start thinking ecologically and saying, you know, that's, that's this year. And even if it's next year, it's okay. The prairie is designed to do this. And there's a lot we can learn from that. Yes. So plenty of food for thought here. Uh, What are some resources that um, farmers or anybody can go to, to kind of keep chewing on this or find more practical examples or resources for implementing changes on their farm um, from the ecology standpoint? Absolutely. So, okay. Shameless self-promotion first, right? I'm going to recommend the Prairie Pod. Yeah. We don't, if you're interested in prairie restoration in particular, that's a great resource for you. You can reach it at mndnr.gov backslash Prairie Pod. And then I'm also going to plug the Xerces Society. They have a ton of great resources for farming for bees, farming for pest management, and there's links also to all of those. And what I like about Xerces is they understand that we all have a short attention span. And so they'll put up like a one page fact sheet, like, Hey, if you're only going to read this, <laughs> these, these are the highlights. And then they'll also give you the longer version so that you can take that deep dive and really figure out how to apply some of these things. And then obviously USDA and RCS, they have a great soil health website. They have a great soil health page. You can go specifically to Minnesota or you can just go to their soil health toolkit and learn a ton of information about what to do. And then the DNR also has great pages on if you want it. We have drought trackers. If you want to see what's what's going on day to day, we have a wonderful climatologist and we have climate pages. If you're curious about predictions for the future or how the weather is going to affect how your production or your farm weathers, we have some good resources on the DNR website also for that. And then I just want to say, like, in case all this is overwhelming to people, you don't have to do it all at once, right? Mm -hmm. Like just try something new and don't be afraid to fail. So what I mean when I say that is don't all of a sudden take however many acres, let's say you're farming 400 acres, don't put cover crops on all of those for the first time in the first year. Like, like start small, get comfortable, make mistakes, figure it out, and then scale up. So that way you're ready, you've worked out the kinks, and that way you can still have your livelihood there that um, obviously you need and is important. And so that's that's the advice I would give <laughs> for that. 
Very Don't solid. do it necessarily all at once. It's okay to start small. Absolutely. Yeah. I also need that reminder so many times. <laughs> You don't have to do everything all at once. It's fine. You don't have to do everything all at once. Mm -hmm. Just follow the rules of thumb, diversity, connection, and community. And just remember when we put our natural resources first, we are putting ourselves first because we all need the same basic things to live, right? It's Mm -hmm. funny because in school, when you study what wildlife need, they could just put humans in there too. Like, oh, they need food, water, shelter, and air. (laughs) Okay, yeah. well, these are all the things that we need to survive also. And we are inextricably interconnected with the land that is providing that for us. And we've got to get back in better balance if we're going to have a chance. Thank you so much for joining, Megan, your passion and uh, just quantity of food for thought here, I think is really invigorating. And I'm I'm glad that you share that with us both in the Beyond Your Backyard columns and and now on the podcast. So thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you for having me. I just love, I love doing this. It's fun. I hope people got some good tips and they're excited about Prairie. Just know that you are a public landowner and there are so many places that you can visit a prairie. So check out the DNR's Recreation Compass and you can find some public lands near you. We need public lands right now more than ever. Our brains are deeply connected to nature. So we're definitely going to need to get outside and take those deep breaths just to feel that that mental ease and wellness and that stress kind of melt away. And thanks also for letting me write a column for you guys in my free time. It's so much fun and I love doing it. Dirt Rich is produced by the Sustainable Farming Association. We believe that agriculture, done well, heals. For more resources or to tap into the Farmer to Farmer Network, visit us at sfa-mn.org.